why did we not evolve to become immortal? This is a question that I recently encountered in one of the comments to a video that discussed the evolution. I thought it was interesting enough to merit an answer, and since it didn't appear to be asked in the smug superiority tone that places you in a line to receive the next cock, it seems that it was an honest question. So, why did we not evolve to become immortal? Well, first of all, this question points to a very important issue that is often unintentionally overlooked when people not versed in evolutionary theory well enough try to analyze its mechanisms and results of the process it describes. Namely, the importance of natural selection. A lot of people, when asked what evolution is, would start describing mutations, which is why we'll rarely see a creationist video describing it without intentionally bringing up the words random, chance, blind, unguided, etc., and making them the central point of the description. But they overlook one simple fact. If mutations, for some reason, completely stop occurring in organisms, the evolution, which is defined as change in allele frequencies over populations, would still occur. There are other ways of introducing new information into the genetic code of an individual, and while I don't possess the knowledge necessary to answer with any sort of certainty if these ways would be enough to produce necessary variety for the survival of life in general, one thing is certain. Even if life would cease to exist as a result of a hypothetical removal of mutations, before it would, the evolution would still continue. This is because the evolution's main driving force is natural selection. Those less adapted to their environment would statistically die more often and with producing less offsprings, with or without mutations playing any role in this, and thus the allele frequencies of their genes that are less adapted would get lower in the next populations, meaning the evolution would still take place. So, with that out of the way, let me explain why I bothered bringing this bit of qualification up. It's because a lot of people underestimate the importance of natural selection in evolution and the question I'm answering is, I think, a prime example of this. Why? Well, let's see. The first reason is that, in the way the question is asked, it seems as it was talking about humans. And that's where the natural selection part comes into play, or rather it doesn't. Our species, in a very short, geologically and evolutionary speaking time, has risen so far above its environment that natural selection rarely applies to us anymore. Which one of us will propagate his or her genetic information to the next population is now defined by social, cultural, ethical, political, and all the other standards that are not found almost anywhere in nature. A human doesn't need to be a fast runner, skillful hunter, have strong immune system and all those other qualities that defined his or her future back in the days before civilization. And, just as well, he or she doesn't need to be immortal to propagate his or her genes. In fact, immortality would have almost nothing to do with it. Unless we assume that his or her endless life would be dedicated to the process of producing offspring. But that's not really the main reason I'm making this video. For simplicity's sake, let's say that we're talking about a simpler organism, non-social one, where its life would be dedicated to procreation. Now, I'm assuming we're not talking about immortality as in this organism would not be able to die by any means, including starvation, being destroyed entirely or partially, killed by diseases, etc. It's that we're only talking about this resulting from imperfections in cell reproduction occurring at old age, i.e. from being subject to Hayflick limit. Or something like this, because otherwise we'd be talking about something physically impossible. But fixing the reproduction mechanism or making an organism an agent, which is what I'm going to call it from this point on, seems like such an obvious and easy thing to do in comparison. We know a little bit about the mechanism responsible for that and we can hypothetically imagine such an organism, so why wouldn't all the species evolve this trait? Well, that's where we get into the mechanics of evolution again. As we know, the changes are guided only by the environmental pressure. For instance, if the environment becomes colder, the species would be better adapted if they had a thicker layer of fat, more hair and fur, preferably white coat, were less wasteful of their energy, etc. But what kind of pressure would guide the process of evolution to make some species an agent? Being an agent doesn't help you in the cold environment, or for that reason, in any environment. In fact, it hinders the propagation of your genes. An unaging specimen would be able to produce more offsprings in its lifetime than an aging one, sure, but when it will inevitably die because of some external reason, 
of its offsprings would bear the genes that are as adapted to the environment as their parent, while the offsprings brought up by normal specimen would, more than likely, have some sort of accumulated change over this period of time, making them more adapted. What's even worse is that as much as our hypothetical unaging specimen would become unfit for its environment, it would, up until its very death, compete over the limited resources with the new generation, and the longer it lives, the more is the chance that it will hinder the evolution by inadvertently or even intentionally killing the more adapted younger specimen. But there is one caveat. If the environment is relatively unchanging and the chance of the ML dying is high enough, this biological mortality can occur, but it will be mostly irrelevant. Just like hypothetically less efficient, from the evolutionary standpoint at least, asexual reproduction is still utilized by a lot of primitive organisms purely because its ineffectiveness is not enough of a problem to outweigh a benefit of rapid population growth it can provide. A species of unaging creatures might not suffer from the problems this immortality causes enough for the natural selection to weed it out, so to speak. For instance, a species of jellyfish, Turchopsis nutricula, is considered possibly the only species on the planet with biological immortality achieved by a process of reverse metamorphosis basically reverting to its immature state after being damaged or sometimes spontaneously after a long period of time, only to repeat the process of its development, and so on. While this was observed only in the lab, scientists see no reason to assume that it never happens in the wild. In fact, this example brings up another potential problem uh, with biological immortality. If it actually is advantageous, as it is believed to be in the case of this species, it runs the risk of unrestricted growth of population, which could potentially become an ecological problem. It is believed to be happening now, with humans accidentally transporting them all over the world in the ballast tanks. In the end, however, it's obvious that those who will suffer from it will include the jellyfish species themselves, since if it will actually become a burden on the ecosystem, it might die out entirely. So, this is the answer to the question why we are not evolved to be immortal. It's a pretty risky thing, not to mention very hard to achieve for an organism more complex than a jellyfish, with evolutionary risks and the risks to the environment in general potentially outweighing the advantages. Thanks for watching.